It's Crosby. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Okay, well, I've got uh, 10.01 in Arizona time. I think it's 1 p.m. over there in, in the East Coast. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody, good morning and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you for day two of the ATOM Digital Inclusion Workshop, Addressing Technology Needs in Native Communities. Um, I hope you had a nice sleep and we're able to kind of di digest and work through some of the great themes that we heard yesterday. We've got another full uh, jam-packed day for you today. So I'm so pleased to be here with you all to, to share in all this knowledge. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Walter Echohawk uh, this morning. Um, he's the chairman of the board of ATOM, as well as the president of the Pawnee Nation. And he's going to share with us a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, I guess it's good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're at. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here and I wanted to uh, join in welcoming, welcoming everyone to this uh, wonderful gathering uh, on day two of it. And I'd like to um, um, uh, render a uh, prayer song to uh, opening open our gathering. And, you know, uh, today I think, um, I know the United Nations uh, 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 UN uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples has been meeting in New York City, and many in our nation are deeply concerned about the well-being of Ukraine and the uh, uh, concerned about the uh, the uh, savage war of conquest that is being uh, uh, perpetrated there. So I wanted to uh, begin our gathering with a prayer song, a, a veteran's uh, prayer song for the uh, soldiers uh, there in Ukraine. And uh, this is a Pawnee song. It, it, it basically asks the uh, creator uh, to send our sons back home to us safely. <clears throat> so if you'll bear with me, I'd like to uh, offer that uh, song to uh, behalf of the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers at this time. Thank you for uh, bearing with me for that. And uh, I, I wanted to uh, just uh, say a brief word um, about um, 
a very exciting uh, digital uh, project here at the Pawnee Nation. Um, we have uh, a number of ILMS grants but the, uh, that we're working on uh, having to do with preserving our uh, culture, uh, uh, creating a tribal uh, archive and research library. But in particular, uh, uh, our principal uh, grant, ILMS grant that we're working on, on now is, is to uh, create a digital archive. So, uh, um, uh, the University of uh, uh, Washington is creating a, a special um, uh, online archive for the Pawnee Nation uh, Indigenous community. And we are in the process of, of uh, uh, negotiating with about 16 or 17 archives around the country that contain um, Pawnee historical and um, cultural uh, archival material and to uh, digitize that material, upload it and transfer it to the Pawnee Nation archive. Um, this work will be the largest transfer of archival material ever done by any Indian nation ever, to my knowledge. Um, and uh, one of the uh, archives that we're working with is the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Uh, um, and uh, they have uh, prioritized this project there at the uh, National Archives um, uh, for uh, digit digitizing the Pawnee cultural material. And they have 34 archives across the country. And um, uh, we have been in discussion with them. And uh, this is in line with the larger goal of the National Archives to begin making its material available, readily available to all Indian nations. And, and they are looking upon this project as a model to do that, a model for the rest of the nation. And uh, we're, we just enjoy a wonderful relationship there. And, and we're uh, uh, hammering out an MOU about how this will be done for the Pawnee project. And uh, hopefully it'll be um, uh, a model that other tribes could use in, in uh, working uh, not only with the National Archives to retrieve your tribal material um, for a tri your tribal archives, but uh, uh, for also for other archives around the country to look to as a model on how to do it. And so uh, we're very excited. Uh, uh, this is a landmark a project for the Pawnee Nation. And I think possibly a precedent setting uh, endeavor. And uh, uh, as we uh, go forward and we're very grateful for the ILMS support to do that because the Pawnee Nation, we're a small nation but we're very rich in our cultural heritage. And I think that through this project, uh, we will be able to create uh, a, a very comprehensive uh, digital archive for our people. And so uh, we're thankful for that and very excited about it. Um, and with that, it's a good segue into introducing uh, Mr. Crosby Kemper. Uh, the director for the ILMS um, and a good friend and a partner uh, with our ATOM organization. And uh, we're so, so uh, uh, blessed and, and fortunate to be able to work with ILMS and, and with Crosby uh, uh, over the past uh, months and, and the past a couple of years, you know. And, and so with that, I want to welcome you, uh, Crosby and uh, and uh, say hello, it's always good to see you and uh, say uh, the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Walter. And, and it's always an honor to be in the same platform, even virtually with you. Uh, and uh, and, and we're, one of the things we are very proud of is, is working with you in partnership uh, with the Pawnee Nation uh, repatriation of, of, uh, of your heritage, uh, which I think is a, a central uh, goal of uh, tribal lands generally, tribal nations generally, and of the IMLS uh, in support of that. And I think this is a model 
uh, program, and and I hope we can extend it. Uh, Susan Feller and uh, Atom and and and, uh, and the IMLS have been in conversation about doing a, a national uh, conference, a convening of some kind uh, on on this subject, so that we can uh, establish some national models and national uh, standards for uh, for for doing this uh, beyond the great work that NAGPRA and others have uh, have done. Um, and so I hope we continue to, to work with you uh, on that. We're, we're honored to, to be able to do it up to this stage. Yes, I, I, I think that the stars are aligned and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to the days ahead as well. Well, I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. And uh, okay, again, with, uh, with my uh, gratitude and welcome. Thank you very much. Well, I just, I, I have a, a couple of comments really uh, uh, about yesterday's program. Great program uh, yesterday. I learned a lot, which is uh uh, is, is uh, good, uh, useful for me to to, to know uh, the many things that were uh, that were said and indicated uh, yesterday. Um, I do a couple of points I'd like to make that I think are pragmatic but philosophically uh, based. Um, in the, in the first presentation uh, yesterday, which was full of great information, uh, Pamela Rosales's uh, 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 presentation. There was one thing she said that I, I'd like to highlight, which I think is not right, um, and uh, uh, motivations were, were absolutely good from the NDIA. By the way, I helped uh, Angela Seifer start the National Digital, National Digital Inclusion Alliance. But she said at the beginning something that I thought was a little odd in speaking to a tribal group. Uh, she, she talked about the distinction between rural and urban, and that we, should, we were paying too much attention to rural, which was primarily white, uh, not enough attention to urban where uh, there are more uh, people of color. There are two things that I think that are uh, wrong with that. In the, in the first place, um, uh, rural poverty um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and rural, the digital divide in the rural, rural world is fairly significant, as I think most people in tribal nations know, because a substantial portion of the tribal population and tribal lands themselves are rural. Um, and uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, the, the, the racial aspect of this, I think, is so much more complicated than the uh, sort of white versus people of color uh, structure that she gave to it. I looked uh, yesterday, uh, Brookings has got an interesting report, which you could, you could look up on rural poverty. Um, uh, but I looked at Mississippi, which, of course, one of the poorest states, if not the poorest state in the union. And there is sub substantial rural population there, substantial rural population of color. Native American population, even the Asian population, which nationally has got the highest income per capita uh, in Mississippi, uh, has got very low income uh, per capita. Um, and, and so, and, and that relates to the digital divide. And we shouldn't be dividing people up in, in that way. We should be looking for all the folks who are, uh, uh, to help all the folks who, are, uh, uh, who need help in the, in the digital divide. Um, I, I, and so I, I make that comment because I think it's really, there's, a, there's an ideological component to, to what we do, and that's inevitable given our history. Um, but we have to be pragmatic and we have to, if we're gonna really be inclusive uh, in what we do, uh, we have to, to include everybody. Um, and, and I thought there was an exclusive uh, aspect uh, to that. I, the rest of her presentation was fabulous. Um, and uh, so this is not 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 critical of the NDIA or of the or of the presentation as a whole, but that one thing bothered me, in, in part because there, as you know, as everybody in this conversation knows, as the IMLS knows, a substantial portion uh, of the tribal uh, universe and and some of the most divided, not just in terms of the digital divide, but in terms of poverty, uh, in in terms of access to education and healthcare, uh, is rural. And, and so I, I, I don't think we should ever establish ourselves and the IMLS wouldn't establish itself as, as on one side or another, rural versus urban. Um, and, and in the tribal universe, of course, you also have the, the interesting uh, combination of the two in that there's so many uh, folks who commute in essence between urban and people who leave tribal lands for jobs and come back uh, in various forms uh, uh, from, from urban areas. Um, so I, it, and, and that also relates to me to, uh, to, to one of the really important things in Mr. John's uh, uh, presentation, uh, which um, uh, 
essentially in, in talking about equity and talking about who gets the money in the tribal universe, um, he, he gave us some interesting statistics and the NTI is doing fabulous work. I was in the very first presentation they made to the uh, to, to tribal uh, tribal nations about the, uh, this program where they have $3 billion uh, that are coming for broadband. Um, and I, I, know, I know what he's said and what we've been in contact with him. I have a meeting coming up in the next week, I think, with Alan Davidson, the uh, director uh, of the NTIA, um, that, that in the first billion dollars, 950 million, um, 280 tribes applied. There are 574, uh, of course, federally recognized tribes. We can probably assume that the 294 tribes that didn't apply may have included some of the neediest tribes, some of the tribes that are the smallest, most rural, um, most farthest away from uh, transportation, unstaffed, uh, no, not traditionally applying for federal programs because they don't have uh, the uh, ability to apply, uh, the, the, the tradition of applying, the uh, staffing to apply, uh, et cetera. Um, and and, and, and I, I know the NTI knows this because I talked to them and the FCC has a similar situation um, uh, as federal agencies. Frequently, we establish rules that exclude people, not include people. One of the great things about uh, 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 Pamela Rosales presentation from our point of view is how strongly the tribal universe feels about the um, uh, the IMLS's uh, uh, grant programs uh, and uh, how important they are in uh, in tribal lands, and that is in part, I think, we've uh, 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 given grants to close to 500 uh, of the 574 uh, uh, federally recognized tribes over the last decade. We have a tiny amount of money compared to this three billion dollars the NTIA has, or the 14 billion dollars plus rate that uh, the FCC has. Uh, but we recognize, we recognize, and not enough, we still need to work on this. This is still a part of our, uh, our strategic plan is to make it even easier, much easier, not even easier, much easier than it is today uh, for, for tribes to apply because we recognize the smaller tribes have got uh, issues with the application process. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's important to recognize the numbers that you heard from, uh, from him yesterday. $16 million of that $950 million in the first tranche has gone out so far a year into the program. Um, we've gotten all of our money. I mean, you'll hear from, uh, from Anthony and Sarah in a minute about our programs, but we've essentially gotten all of our money out. Now, our entire 10-year history doesn't equal a fraction of the $3 billion or the $17 billion that we're talking about from just those two, uh, two agencies. Um, but that leads me to, to, to the, uh, the, the next thing that I wanted to say about his presentation, which is he emphasized something that I want to redouble and tell you is absolutely important. I should have said yesterday myself, the digital equity plan is the core of uh, how money is going to be spent at the state level. Uh, and to the extent that tribes can be involved uh, in the establishment of digital equity plans, should be talking to your state librarian, should be talking to anybody at the, at the state level that you know this is going to come out of governor's offices primarily, and state broadband authorities to some extent state libraries are, are involved in it, but not everywhere. Uh, and that's where the money will, the, the serious amount of money, the $42 billion uh, will come. We fought very hard for the word library to be included in the infrastructure plan. We fought very hard for the word library to be included in the $13 billion emergency connection uh, plan from the FCC. We've, we've spent a lot of time with the NTIA making sure that they, and I think they do, know that libraries uh, uh, need some of this money um, and, and cultural centers in the tribal and tribal lands to include tribes uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the designation uh, designations in all of these uh, programs has been something we fought for inside uh, the federal government. And, and I think the word equity is the, is the key here. We're really going to spend this money equitably. Um, it, uh, it has to go to the tribes, but not, not just some, to all of the tribes, and particularly to smaller tribes, particularly to the most needful uh, tribes. Uh, and then the, uh, the last thing um, I, I want to mention is uh, Pamela Rosales had some great uh, 
little test questions in the most connected cities. She did uh, the four cities and Chattanooga was the, the answer to that. Um, and this is a demonstration of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Chattanooga is one of the most uh, wired cities and connected cities. It's a municipal utility because they made a decision, uh, a, a municipal decision, a city decision that they were gonna do that. Kansas City made a similar decision at about exactly the same time when Google Fiber came to Kansas City. And I spent time uh, with the folks in Chattanooga. And what I'm going to tell you now is my experience in the first couple of years with, with, uh, with Chattanooga and Kansas City. Uh, it's probably changed. They probably figure out their problems to some extent. Uh, but when they rolled out uh, the, the gigabit platform in Chattanooga simultaneously to our rolling it out with Google Fiber in Kansas City, they had exactly the same problem we had, which is to say they had to get somebody to pay for it. And so their original plan, uh, though it was cheaper than uh, the plans that were available from the commercial providers, the ISPs in, uh, in Chattanooga, they weren't that cheap and they didn't actually sign up most of the people the vast majority of people on the other side of the digital divide. In Kansas City, Google created a, a platform that was similar to that in that they originally they thought, well, everybody will sign up for this service because it's going to be so great. That was their experience with uh, everybody signing up for, for Google, the search engine, right? Um, only this, as they didn't realize as soon as they put a price on it, and they had a very, a very inexpensive alternative, what was in fact at the time the most inexpensive alternative uh, of any major provider in the United States. Um, but they also uh, uh, realized uh, suddenly when they got to Kansas City that, that folks on the other side of the digital divide and all the other divides, the economic divides, weren't going to sign up for it. Um, so they, they decided they didn't want to build infrastructure for places that wouldn't sign up for it, so they put a $15 fee on just signing up, on just making yourself available and where they would put the infrastructure. So we gamed, the, there was a sort of gaming, a kind of redlining to that. So we gamed that. We, the friends of the Kansas City Public Library, where I was the director at the time, we went out and, and into the community, into all parts of the community in our district, but particularly the poor parts of the community, also people of color parts of our community. Um, and we, we provided the $15 fee. So that Google Fiber was forced to provide the infrastructure, the you know close to the last mile uh, 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 in every neighborhood, and they had an inexpensive alternative. But it was still true in both Kansas City and Chattanooga that people didn't sign up for it. Some of it was economic, but some of it was also about understanding, understanding the use, understanding use for skill development, workforce development, for healthcare. Uh, for uh, for education, for all the things we're talking about. And, and so my final point about all of this, about both presentations yesterday and what I really want to say and should have said yesterday, is real equity and real inclusion um, is not just about signing people up or connecting people. Connecting people is important and having the infrastructure to connect people is really important. But you've got to help people understand how to use the internet. Um, and uh, at, at the end of the day, our programs with, in the tribal universe have been about that through libraries, through cultural centers, through museums, uh, through, through the various entities that are already providing service uh, uh, of the useful kind uh, to, uh, to members of, uh, of tribes. Every dollar we spend, in my view, and I wouldn't say this about probably any other federal program, but I think every dollar that we spend, and really what I'm talking about is every dollar that you spend uh, in, uh, in the tribal universe is a dollar well spent. And so when you're talking to folks about those di uh, digital equity plans at the state level, uh, uh, try, try and remember that. And, and, uh, and, and if we can help in any way, um, if we can help introduce uh, you to your state library. And if you don't, don't know the state library and if they haven't had responsibility for the tribes, because I believe now through the, through the infrastructure money in particular, um, uh, that, that money is available uh, to and available to or through the state librarians too. Um, if you need our help in doing any of that, we're here to do that. Because at the end of the day, what we're, what we're about is directly helping you directly help tribal members 
uh, to, uh, to cross the various divides in this country. So thank you again for letting me speak to you. Thank you for the uh, kind words that we heard uh, about the IMLS yesterday, Walter Echohawk for his uh, kind words uh, today. Um, and uh, we're here for you. And I know you have the, you have the, real, the real folks from the, uh, the IMLS coming up uh, momentarily in uh, uh, Anthony and Sarah. So I'll turn it over to you again. Thank you, Crosby. All such great points. Uh, um, he, he's a tough act to follow, but I'm, I'm going to try to uh, step in and share a little bit about our, our grant programs. I, I, I wanted to um, start by giving a, just a sort of special shout out to our friends on the call from the Pacific Islands, um, where it's just a little after 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, my name's Anthony Smith. Uh, uh, I'm the Associate Deputy Director for uh, the Discretionary Programs in the Office of Library Services. Um, I'm happy uh, to be joined by my colleague, Sarah Glass, uh, from the Office of Museum Services for this overview of uh, our funding opportunities available at IMLS. Um, I'm going to walk you through the opportunities for libraries, and then uh, Sarah will pick up and talk a little bit about uh, museum programs as well. Um, so, so here's what I'll be covering today. Um, so our, our five regular programs, which you see on, on the slide here, um, and I'll also talk a little about uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, in 2021. Um, also, I've added uh, the link to our webinar archive at the bottom of the page. And so here you'll find um, on-demand or full coverage webinars for each of our grant programs um, that you can watch at your leisure. Um, Anthony, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't think your uh, screen is sharing properly to see the slides. Thank you. Let me see here. Let me try to, sorry about that. Can you see them now? That's better, thank you. Ah. Thanks. So, so these are the these are the five um, regular programs I mentioned just a moment ago, um, um, and um, and in addition to that, when I'll talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan as well. So. <laughs> I, I recognize that there's a, a lot of content uh, on this slide, um, but it's intended to hopefully just sort of serve as a, a, a quick reference for you to give you an, sort of an overall snapshot of the, the different categories, um, award amounts, uh, and cost share requirements. Um, sort of, a, sort of a, a quick cheat sheet, if you will. The first is our, our National Leadership Grants for Libraries program, and which is commonly known as NLG. Um, this, this grant program supports projects that address uh, critical needs of the library and archives fields and, and have the potential to advance practice in these professions to strengthen library and archival services. Also, there's the Laura Bush 21st Century Program, um, commonly known as LB21. And it's, it's designed to support the development of a diverse workforce of librarians and archivists um, in order to meet information needs of, of their communities. So what's different about the two? Uh, if, if your project is primarily about education and training for information pro professionals, um, either, either formal or, or informal education, um, you should probably be looking at the Laura Bush 21st Century uh, program. 
Um, and for non-tenured uh, tenure track faculty members interested in research funding, you'll want to look at the early career research development category, which is the, the second role from the bottom uh, in the Laura Bush 21st century program. Um, otherwise, any other work of broad uh, level significant uh, uh, significance to libraries and archives and and information science will likely fall under the, the National Leadership Grant Program. Um, the purposes are different, but structurally, they, these programs are very similar. Now, the, these programs are available to uh, a wide range of, of libraries, um, as well as support organizations, such as library associations, uh, consortiums, um, uh, tribal communities. Um, so there, it, it, there's a broad audience for, for these two programs. So here, here's just a few key dates to help you get uh, started at least thinking about the timeline if you're interested in competing in the upcoming cycle. We use a two-tier review process for these programs. So for the September deadline, we ask for a two-page overview of your project idea, along with some supporting documents. So there's a few extra documents that would go along with that, but it's a, it's a fairly uh, light application uh, in that first round. We send these uh, proposals out for peer review um, and then hold panel discussions with reviewers in December. Uh, those that do well, we invite uh, to submit full proposals, which are, again, are also uh, peer reviewed. Now, just, just so you're aware, um, we, we generally receive a relatively small number of applications from indigenous communities for these two programs. I, I just think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for increased support, and I feel as though we need to we need to do a better job of creating awareness about these programs. Um, I'm hoping today I piqued your interest enough to, to take a closer look at the funding opportunities and maybe schedule time to talk with a program officer about your project idea. Now, there are three specific programs that are targeted to support the needs of indigenous communities. Um, the first is the Native American Basic Grant Program, which is intended to support uh, existing library operations and uh, core library services. Uh, this program has funded a wide range of operational needs from staff salaries to computers, to fueling uh, the operation of a generator in remote regions of Alaska. Um, it's, it's a non-competitive program. Uh, however, it does require that we receive a full proposal uh, by the March deadline. The Native American Enhancement and Native Hawaiian programs have three goals in mind improve digital services, improve educational programs, and enhance the preservation and revitalization of language. And I'll talk more about the program goals in just a little bit here. Now, prior to 2022, uh, to be eligible for Native American Enhancement, you were, you were re required to have applied for the Native American uh, Basic in that same funding year. Thanks to feedback we've received during the nation to nation listening sessions and the public requests for information, we've been able to remove this longstanding requirement for the Native American Enhancement Program beginning this year in 2022. Also, I just wanted to mention uh, briefly, we're currently evaluating the, the four specific grant programs that are available only to indigenous communities. Uh, three here that you see on the uh, slide, and Sarah's gonna talk about a, a fourth here in just a bit. Um, 
but this evaluation is, is intended to look for ways we can improve these programs. And that work is ongoing. I, I believe we'll have an update in the fall. Uh, I need to confirm that with our research and evaluation team, but I think that's, that's, that's the plan. Um, so yesterday, uh, someone asked the question, is there any grant funding to teach people about cybersecurity? How to be safe with personally identifiable information? So there's really two questions there. Yeah, my response to the, the, both of these questions is that um, you know, safety and privacy are real concerns in the digital space. Uh, and I, and I, I think addressing these concerns align with all five of our grant programs. So if you, you have ideas around literacy programs, either for community members or for library staff, I would, I would encourage you to contact one of our program officers to discuss your program ideas. Uh, they can direct you to the uh, uh, appropriate uh, grant program, um, but, but also share uh, any previous funded work in this area that that may exist. Um, I know I'm aware of a project we funded last year uh, to Old Dominion University um, to establish a graduate certificate in web archiving. And it's, it's sort of a multidisciplinary approach to, uh, to, to this graduate certificate in web archiving. And it integrates cybersecurity as part of the program. Um, and there may be others, but again, I would encourage you to reach out and contact um, uh, contact us, and we can we can connect you with the right um, the right program officer for that. Okay, ne next, I'd like to just share a bit about the response to the notice of funding for the Native American Enhancement and Native Hawaiian programs last year. Now. As you can see on this slide, funds were available to support a high number of the proposals we received. Um, we, we were able to support 27 of the 34 proposals we received last year. Um, that's pretty good as, in, as far as grant programs go. Um, so I, I told you we would come back to the program goals. And so let me explain what this slide um, represents. So both uh, Native American and Native Hawaiian opportunities have the three goals I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, improving digital services, improve educational programs, and support language preservation. Of the 27 awards we made in 2021, there are 47 goals being accomplished in all. How's that, right? Projects can address multiple goals. For example, an educational program delivered online is meeting two goals. And as Crosby mentioned in his opening comments yesterday, use of the internet is an important measure of success. I'm not sure he said it quite that way, but you get the point. For, for us, the goal to improve digital services uh, is intended to support needs for education, workforce development, economic and business, health information, um, and other areas of importance to communities we're serving. What's, so what did some of these projects look like? Uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians is currently recording elder and community member stories, digitizing existing cultural audiovisual recordings that need to be preserved and shared, implementing a digital preservation plan and making the materials accessible online through Mukutu content management system. And, and IMLS also funded Mukutu through uh, both NLG and LB21 grant programs. Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior will digitize community newspapers as they uh, serve as important primary 
sources documenting uh, tribal elections, genealogy and photographs. Um, other materials include scrapbooks, yearbooks, and newsletters. And we, heard, we heard yesterday in Miriam's presentation the high value placed on, on uh, genealogy resources. So, so last year, we also had funds available through the American Rescue Plan uh, to create a special funding opportunity to support indigenous museums and libraries. The goal uh, provide direct support to address community needs created or exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic and support recovery. Now, in the second half of last year, Libraries and museums were assessing the situation around them to determine how to best leverage the availability of these, these funds, right? And at the same time, the Delta variant was becoming the dominant strain of COVID-19 in the US. So this, this special funding opportunity had six specific goals. And you can see in the diagram how the community responded to each of those. Now, the first three, 1.1 through 1.3, are intended to help strengthen institutional capacity. And the second three um, are focused on the well being of the communities we serve. All of, all of the goals are relatively well represented uh, with 2.1 support the creation and delivery of online and in-person educational, interpretive, and experiential programming and exhibitions, sort of sitting at the top of the spectrum. And it's a pretty narrow spectrum. Um, but here's a couple of examples of um, things that we funded uh, through ARP. Due to the increased demand for online access to collection materials that has been accelerated by the pandemic, the Squaxin Island Museum Library and Research Center will digitize existing museum materials into easily accessible online content. Uh, Fort McDowell, Yavapai Nation is strengthening its online cultural and learning platforms, which users have accessed on a unprecedented scale since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in doing so, they're publishing the Yavapai Dictionary as a mobile app, expanding the availability of ebooks, and purchasing laptops and internet hotspots for use by students and community members. So here's the contact info for myself, uh, Maeve, and Sheena. We're happy to answer, help answer any questions you have uh, and connect you with the appropriate program officer uh, to discuss your work in more depth. Um, thanks for lending me your ear and I'll, I'll now turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks so much. And thanks for being my slide forwarder for me as well. Got you covered, um, Sarah. Thank you. So I know we want to try to uh, keep on time here, and I know we're running a little behind already. So I am going to actually course correct myself a bit. Um, I do have uh, more, more slides than I will probably touch on right now. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, Anthony, I might be having you skip ahead a little bit just so we can stay. I want to be respectful to, uh, to Atom and to everyone here. I know we've got a lot more great things to cover. Um, so thank you and hello everyone. As um, has been said, my name is Sarah Glass. I am a senior program officer here in the IMLS Office of Museum Services. And I'm very honored to be here speaking with you today. Um, I believe I actually might be the newest staff member at IMLS. I have been with the agency for just over a month now, um, but that's a little bit misleading because I actually was at IMLS for several years back in the uh, 2013, 16 range before jumping ship to go over and work on the National NAGPRA program, um, which hopefully many of you are familiar with. And um, I was helping fund that very meaningful work, but I could not stay away. And so when an opportunity came, I jumped back over to IMLS and I'm so glad I did. Um, 
And I wanna just thank A. Tom very quickly for putting on this workshop and thank Mr. Echohawk for his song today and also Director Crosby for your comments. I'm very excited. Anything that has to do with repatriation, obviously I'm, um, I'm on board. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna jump right in. So next slide, thank you. So for the sake of time today, I'm not going to cover all of the various grant programs that the museum side of IMLS offers, but you can um, look them up on our website. All the information is there, all the in-depth um, details uh, as far as eligibility and, and what the purposes and goals of those programs are. We always encourage um, any, anyone who's interested in any of them to reach out to us, talk to the staff, we are all real people who will answer our phones and are happy to give you more guidance and talk to you about each of these individual programs. We actually also have a lot of pre-recorded webinars and videos and information that helps get you a sense of things too. But I'm just gonna really quickly cover some basics around our Native American, Native Hawaiian Museum Services Program. Next slide, please. And actually go ahead to the next one. <laughs> so, like I said, do you know what? Let's keep going. I'm gonna, I know a better place for this info. So I'm, a lot of what I'm gonna describe actually sounds very similar to many of the library um, side of the house as far as some of the types of activities and, and things we fund and offer. Um, it's really more about, you know, are you writing your proposal from the library entity and perspective or are you writing it from a museum or a cultural center or are those two the same thing? Um, so we see all different sorts um, in, in you know, our culture keepers uh, from indigenous communities. So I, I wanna just make clear the key dates for the upcoming cycle. We're actually right in the middle of about to fund our 2022 awards, but um, the next upcoming uh, availability will be starting this fall. And all of our grant programs on the museum side have a deadline this year of November 15th. So if nothing else, that is the big date to highlight and circle in your calendar um, if you are interested in seeking funds for any of these types of activities. Okay, next slide, please. And that's why I skipped the previous heavy chart slides is because I knew this one was gonna have the more in-depth info, just the basics really of the Native American, Native Hawaiian uh, Museum Services Program. So the, the purpose is really to help sustain heritage, culture, knowledge uh, among Indian tribes and organizations that serve Native Hawaiians. Um, the projects can be one to three years. As you can see, the funding levels are there and we do not require any cost share for this program whatsoever. And again, there's that big date, November 15th, if you're interested in applying. Next slide, please. I wanna go over the, the three goals that we have within this program in a little more detail very quickly. Um, as you could see, number one is um, empowering people of all ages and backgrounds through um, activities such as programs for all types of audiences, exhibitions, interpretation, digital media, or um, activities that support the growth and development of Native American, Native Alaskan, and Hawaiian museum professionals. So you'll probably hear some similarities between ours and, and the library side. Um, next slide, please. Ethan. Our second goal is to build the capacity of, of these tribal organizations to serve their communities and their tribes. Um, this could be through instant uh, planning, policy development, technology enhancements. We've seen several applications come in for planning for museums or cultural centers for a tribe. Um, and, we, and we welcome all, site, all types of that. And also staffing capacity, I think, could fit in well here as, as well. And next slide, please. The third and final goal of the program is to also um, help advance the management and care of collections and those associated documentation. So um, projects aligned with this goal could involve many very broad types of collections care. Um, and we actually also have an additional focus on projects that help support the preservation or um, expansion of indigenous languages and traditional cultural practices. So in, we know that um, we've heard feedback over the years that funding um, language preservation has always been a very high priority given that you know, the native speakers may not be always around as, as long as we'd like. Um, and I'm gonna get to some examples very quickly, but I first wanna just make clear the point because I know I skipped over it. 
our um, our museum services program, this Native American Native Hawaiian program, the legal applicants to this program is um, technically must be the, the tribe itself. So it's a way of limiting um, in a good way, but we could argue we could, I welcome feedback if that's not the case. It's meant to be a way to limit so that every museum out there in the country cannot apply for these same funds. It's a special, um, this grant program was specially set aside so that only federally recognized Indian tribes Alaska Native Villages of Native Corporations and um, Hawaiian uh, primarily serving organizations that serve Native Hawaiians are, are the eligible applicants. And that's really a way to kind of keep, um, keep, keep some funds not set aside, but you, you know, specially tailored and specially geared towards um, those entities. But um, you know, if you, you have a tribal museum and, and they are likely going to be the ones that are doing the work, they just can't be the main applicant, but they will obviously be very involved in the projects. So I just want to make that clear. It's, it's museum services for a tribe. It doesn't mean you have to have a museum um, or a cultural center. It's, it's anything that can help support these types of activities and goals that I've just, that I've just described. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I, I, in the sake, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of our great examples, but um, you can always go on our website and we have a great search tool where you can type in um, keywords and you can also filter um, to see which kinds of, of um, which kinds of programs and projects that you're interested in seeing what's been funded and what's out there. So um, we, I, you know, I wanted to provide just a few examples of the types of um, digital inclusion or digital access, digital digitization, all sorts of um, great work that the uh, tribal cultural bearers are, are doing as well. So whether that's archiving, such as here, providing things online, doing digital exhibitions, um, next slide, please, Anthony. Um, this was a great, uh, it, a very interesting project where they're trying to make um, natural resources more accessible through providing more virtual um, on, you know, online access through uh, 3D, 360 degree videos and, and bringing kind of these virtual uh, virtual spaces to, to more people across Hawaii in that way. And last but not least, next slide please. And this is a great example of a language preservation project that we funded with the Alutic Museum, um, helping go back and, uh, and digitize and bring um, online and more fully flush out these 22 seasons worth of their word of the week lessons. Next slide please. So all sorts of things that we fund. And here are, is my contact information and then our program specialist that also assists me with the Native American Native Hawaiian Museum Services Program is Jennifer Onstadt. And again, I'll just say we welcome uh, all questions, comments, feedback. Um, Anthony mentioned that we are doing this evaluation of our uh, programs across both sides that serve primarily our, our indigenous communities. And so we are really, um, taking a close look at, at what needs are out there and whether or not we're meeting them and how our programs can be improved. So I would extend um, my own door is always open virtually and I'm very happy to, to answer any questions. And sorry I spoke really quickly, but thank you again. Thanks for having me. I don't know if we have time for questions, but. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we've got to go go along to the next session, but thank you so much, Anthony and Sarah, for, for all that information and for, for sharing your contact info. I encourage folks to, to reach out and, and get started on, on funding some of those dream projects that you have. We know how critical IMLS funding is for our library and museum services and, um, and supporting communities um, really throughout, um, throughout the country. Um, and one thing that always impresses me about IMLS funding is is the freedom to to do things in a meaningful way and to to take steps towards decolonizing some of those practices and to bringing uh, bringing our power of telling our stories to the communities directly. 
Um, one project that I really love to, um, to watch along with is um, out of um, ASU's Labriola American Indian Data Center. That's really a, a leader in some of this community facing work. Um, so with that, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Alex Soto, who is the director of the Labriola Center, uh, Lourdes Pereira, um, and Elizabeth uh, Kikora, um, who are the student uh, archivists and librarians at the center. And they're going to share with us today about some of the fantastic work that they're doing to um, decolonize archives and, and bring that power to, um, to those in the community who um, have things to share. So, Alex? Oh, thank you for the intro, Nicole. Um, Skuktash, Anya Natchugi, Alex Soto, Anya Anap Amjik, Awasik, Thonautam Amjik. So, uh, good day, good morning. My name is Alex Soto, originally from the Thonautam Nation, from the community of cells. As mentioned in this capacity, I'm the director here at the Labriola National American Indian Data Center here at Arizona State University Library. And for today, uh, we were uh, asked uh, to share some of our work that we're doing around digital programming or what work we've done for some years in light of really starting with COVID and then fast forward to how we're still, um, you know, using these uh, mediums for digital platforms as a way to share our community engagement and also just our overall, overall work in archiving to Native communities and beyond. But before we get into that, I'll have my staff introduce themselves. So who wants to go first? So good morning, everyone. My name is Lourdes Pereira and and I come from the San Lucie District of the Thonautam Nation. I'm a double major here at ASU and I'm also a Labriola aide and archivist. Safa, how good I? Uh, I guess for you guys since it's the afternoon, but um, uh, hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth. I'm originally, originally from the Stone Shrodag, um, in the district of the Chukakuk, uh, in the Thonautam Nation. I'm also a, a student archivist and librarian here at Labriola and a senior here at ASU studying American Indian Studies. Thank you for uh, sharing who we are. And I think it's important to note that with the Labriola staff, you know, we are diverse in, in different positions and ranges of the work that we're doing. And you'll hear that throughout. And so for today, um, we just wanted to, here's the overview of what we'll share. And for those probably unfamiliar with Labriola, uh, I can give you a quick overview and how that relates to um, the work we're doing now in digital programming and, and partnering with tribal libraries and other tribal departments and communities. And so, yeah, we'll do that and then have a quick overview, well, not quick overview, a thorough overview of our story time uh, activities and our show and share event, which is um, an engagement that or community driven archive engagement um, that we put together and also how it relates to uh, social media and getting the word out. And one thing I would like to stress throughout this is, you know, with um, our uh, participation here, you know, we just wanted to share you know, one example of what this looks like. I know all, all our communities have responded in different ways, you know, regarding uh, initially with COVID and how to engage online and, you know, based on capacity and needs, you know, and it looks different everywhere. And I think here at ASU, uh, at the Labriova Center, we definitely uh, want to be a source, a resource for our community. And so this was uh, the steps that we are, you know, what, what made sense for us in our area. And so with that said, just to, again, center where we're at, and this is how we center ourselves in all our work, you know, for those unfamiliar with Arizona or uh, three autumn librarians here, archivists here, is that, you know, we are originally, our ancestral areas are from the area of what is now Phoenix, going down to uh, Hermosillo, Mexico, and everywhere between, including Tucson, uh, Ajo, and other, you know, areas in the middle. And so I just want to center that because a lot of what we do for the center here is to always, you know, uplift and, you know, really center autumn voices in our, our services, our, our resources and programming and how that relates to the larger ASU native student body and tribal community, our local regional tribal communities. And so that's always a uh, more better than establishing a land acknowledgement statement that we tend to always say in the beginning of these talks, but just to really know in this case, we have Otham uh, librarians, Otham archivists, Otham you know, staff here, along with other uh, the Dene staff and folks we have in our team, an all native led team here at ASU to show the importance of what that means when we connect around programming, especially digital programming. 
And so the one-on-ones, I guess, relating back to um, Labriola, this background, you know, we've been around since 1993. Uh, initially, it was established as, a, well, for an endowment. And with that, it was initially a collection. Throughout that time, it became more of a center throughout the 2000s. And only until my time here at Labriola since 2019 and more officially as the director in 2021 is led by native librarians, in this case, an Otham librarian. And so, yeah, we our main purpose is to support scholarship and instruction and just all overall library services here at ASU. Um, but really positioning ourselves beyond an academic library, um, we are serve as a community center. Um, throughout, you know, my time here, I've been able to, you know, indigenize these spaces to make culturally safe spaces for first our students, but also community members that utilize the Labriola, whether that's uh, in person initially, right, and then fast forward with how the world is online and what does that look like in the virtual culturally safe space. And so with that, we were able to adopt services such as community driven archives under my time as director, along with more culturally appropriate uh, library services and research support and other you know, areas that we can indigenize through library or librarianship. And with that, we also have two campuses. Um, so just wanted to note to also to how this relates to our, our vision here, you know, as far as our communities and just the importance of you know, going beyond being a library. And in the case of the era of COVID, finding ways to not limit our um, support only to ASU students. At times it was that initially because we are ASU and we're a native library here, but also to know how this we can be a, a resource for tribal communities. And so just wanted to share at least our vision statement. Um, we have more information on our website, which I'll share at the end. And so with that, um, click on it. Seems like I have a little delay on my end clicking on things. Let's see, did it click over? Uh, oh, there it goes. And again, just noting that we have all these resources at the Labriola Center, uh, obviously books, and um, I think I, yeah, skip one, uh, and all the events that we do. And so as a center, you know, we're in a position when COVID hit to find ways to translate our in-person uh, events, our, our services, like we all did. And, you know, knowing that it is a vital resource, a vital, uh, you know, um, you know, line of, you know, support for Native students, but also community. And so definitely, you know, we had to reflect on that and understand where our, where our work needed to go and also hearing needs from tribal communities. And also knowing that, you know, for libraries in general, whether that's a library, an archive, or a museum, knowing that it should be a community space, regardless of the institution, you know, that's overseeing it, you know, especially in the case of a non-native institution as large as Arizona State University, knowing that we have a commitment um, that we would community to want to, you know, not just limit ourselves to only ASU students, but finding ways to engage beyond ASU because ultimately we want to show the power of libraries and archives in our community. And so, again, just trying to find ways to do that during COVID was quite interesting. But for today, we do have the three examples I shared in the beginning, which I don't know why my thing's going all around. But yeah, to share our books. But with that said, I wanted to pass the mic to Lourdes here because she can speak on our initial uh, programming around story time. Thank you, Alex. I think this really connects with what Alex has shared thus far, right, on the connection side. Um, and engaging with our communities outside of ASU, but also inside ASU as well. And um, so I'll be talking about story time today. You can click the next Labriola story time. So Labriola story time follows Labriola's mission and vision to support tribal sovereignty and provide resources to surrounding tribal communities. You can, next one. And um, this initiative really started, uh, like why, why would we wanna implement this? You know, we, we asked that question and um, at the time, as you see here, I'm in the top left hand corner, I was the current Miss Indigenous ASU 2020-2022 at the time, and the former, I think at the time she was the current Miss Indian Arizona, which um, Amy uh, Spotted Wolf, you can see her in the top right corner, she was actually a teacher at the time for Indian Oasis on the Thanatham Nation, and she asked me to read to their class. So I actually reached out to Alex. I've obviously I've been working for Labriola about two years now. And to find a book, I was talking to Alex about, you know, what he thinks would be a good resource to show the kids and all these different things. And um, from that, I really sparked this idea of um, Labriola story time. It kind of, it also started with, with just my engaging side of things on the campus. So if you click the next slide, Alex, um, thank you. So. 
I was doing a lot of work with my community, uh, San Lucy District. There was some events there. There was also some events happening on campus with little kids and little babies. And if you know me, I love children. I come from a family of nine sisters and four brothers. So I'm a really family oriented person as we are as indigenous peoples. And um, that's when I was really just starting to think about all these different things on how to connect um, our tribal communities with Labriola. And I think that was always um, a push for me and really a push for this initiative. You could click the next slide. And um, with my background prior to being Miss Indigenous ASU, I had a lot of work with the Tucson Native Youth Council. I was the female co-president for that. And we did a lot of work with the Donatham Youth Council as well, and um, also the Paspoyaki Youth Council. So I already had these connections with my community and um, growing up with my peers as well. And um, that's really where it was, it would kind of just fit perfectly, I think. And you can click the next slide. And that's where I made the connection really from my background of being Miss and you having that experience with Youth Council in my community, it just formed this beautiful story time engagement uh, 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 project really. So what I connected or what um, I'm, I really wanted to do here was push the Labriola resources um, with our tribal surrounding tribal communities. Um, there was a lot of uh, tribal outreach opportunity. There's potential for student volunteers as well. At, at this time, we're still building up our story time. So this hasn't happened yet, but I believe that that's a potential opportunity. There's also um, the opportunity for sharing information of higher education with youth in tribal communities, seeing themselves in these spaces. And I thought that that was a really big, uh, a big piece that stood out to me because um, as I go through the slides, you'll see that it was myself and Liz. And I know when I was a youth, it was very rare to see an Otham, almost like an Otham woman in a position to go to our tribal communities and talk about higher education. The only Otham woman role model I really had when it came to higher education was my mom, I'm Christina Andrews. And that was really it, you don't really see us. And even um, Alex Soto being an awesome director here at ASU, he's one of a kind. <laughs> um, but it was, I think that that was really influential in, in this project and in, in story time, having our own people go out to our own communities is, is a really big deal. And uh, lastly, benefiting internal, internal and external indigenous communities and their libraries. That was really important because there wasn't yet, uh, Alex had a lot of connections as well with the libraries on the nation and um, surrounding tribal communities, but that's also a big benefit we can have with story time. And you can um, go ahead, Alex. So this is just the breakdown of really what we did. Um, it was a push for me, but I also would like to acknowledge Liz as well because we kind of met on, on during a summertime to really put this together and we were able to make everything that we're showing you here. Um, so what we start with, we these are slides that we did with the Benito Garcia Library and the Thanatham Nation and Cells. And we also, um, recently had another story time with the San Simone School um, in the Thought of the Nation as well. So this first slide goes over, um, oh, uh, yes, uh, both of them are both story time. I, when I think of story time, I always go back to really like my youth council days, that engagement side is what I always look for and what I aspire to have in each session. I wanna make sure, I know these are, most most of them are just kids, they're babies, I think. And so I know they wouldn't just wanna be sitting and you know looking at a screen, they wanna be engaged, they wanna stand up and do little activities. So to keep them focused, what I really wanted to do, uh, myself and Liz, we wanted to ask them questions, gauge their interest. So as we're reading a book, they can start thinking about these questions. So for example, this book was, I Want to Be a Superhero. The author is um, uh, Aborigines from Australia. And we asked a few questions, right? If they were a superhero, what would they um, want to be? What would they want to look like? Um, what would their name want to be, right? Uh, we're asking these questions in the beginning. You can go ahead, next one, yeah. And um, for so for this separate book, we had an I Spy game. They were supposed to look at a flower. And like Alex said, this was a time where it was strictly virtual. So we had to really change 
what we wanted from this because it's hard to, to engage folks virtually as we see in our communities um, and, and during the pandemic it was really difficult so we had little little questions or little games with the kids to engage them as we were reading a story so that they weren't just looking um, at a screen which a lot of the students were all year because of the pandemic in school you can click the next one we also, so at the end of these, uh, of the sessions with the stories, we had a show and share. And I know that our next, um, Liz will be going over more of that community-driven community, community -driven archival side, um, but that's really what we do. And I know Alex shared some of the, the flyers at Labriola. It's just introducing this to the students early. So um, of not aside of the questions, we also had them drawing pictures. And that's what they, at the end of the, at the end of the book, they were just um, sharing that to all of us or whoever really volunteered them, their, themselves, they were able to show like what superhero they had and, and talk about the superpowers and how that benefits their community. Um, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It's really cool to see how artistic all of our students are. You can click the next one. Uh, this was another um, another example of that engaging side. We had a wheel of names. You can get that on Google. You just put in every student's name and then it just wheels them out. So they don't necessarily have to raise their hand and volunteer. They can just, um, you can just put their names in a Google wheel, tech, tech digital wheel, um, and it pops out. And we asked the questions again, what's the talent you have getting to know our students and they were drawing this during a time which was really awesome. You can click the next, next one. And then we also had an emoji check and these are more uh, icebreaker things. I love icebreakers. I think they're a lot of fun, but it's also a great way to reach our students. Um, so emoji check was to help the students, the, the kids with using the Zoom platform. A lot of students were um, having to use or Zoom for school purposes and things like that, but many of them didn't still know how to use Zoom. So what um, my, me and Liz did was ask, they, we called it a Zoom check or emoji check where we just wanna check in with the kids and they can click a little emoji and then we can ask them, how are you feeling? How, you know, uh, what are you looking forward to? Things like that and it opens up a conversation, but that was also a really great tool. You can click the next one. We also had a um, ice, another icebreaker, which is Autumn awesome Says. Like I said, I love icebreakers. So instead of Simon Says, we tailor the, um, the icebreaker to our audience. And these students were from our Autumn. They're from the Thun Autumn Nation, and that's what we tailored it to. Um, and we hope that you, use, that you all use some of these, these tools and tricks that, that we're sharing with you today. You can click the next slide. And so some of the takeaways here from Storytime, Storytime is a great way to engage in outreach to tribal communities. It's important to adjust materials accordingly to cultural sensitive materials. Uh, during the time we were picking out books to read for Storytime, there was actually a concern with one of them from one of the, our coworkers at the time who was uh, Navajo. And uh, they mentioned that it was just an inappropriate time to use a certain book because it wasn't winter. We acknowledged that and we adjusted accordingly. So um, some takeaways I would give to everyone who's interested in story time, just make sure you adjust accordingly to those sensitive uh, sensitive cultural, cultural materials and uh, tailor story time to each audience. Um, we're, we're awesome, me and Liz are awesome. We're talking to awesome students. So we adjusted our materials accordingly. And um, also benefit, story time benefits internal and external indigenous uh, communities and their libraries. Reading is fun and libraries are fun and we could do cool fun work um, in, in awesome ways to our communities. So I hope but that you all learned a little bit of something with story time and that you take a little bit away. So thank you so much, Sapa. Thank you for, for giving an overview of, of your efforts. And I just wanted to note that this idea, or she already said it, but I'll, I'll double down on it, is that this was an initiative from our student team, you know, and I didn't list or know earlier at the time uh, myself, I was the only, I guess you would say the staff person in, in place here as a librarian with an awesome student team. And so she reached out and we had that conversation and, you know, again, aligning with our intentions here at Labriola and how it relates to our community uh, component. And yeah, I mean, obviously story times are hand in hand with library work. And, you know, for today, we just wanted to share you know, what that can look like online. Of course, you know, tailoring, uh, Autumn says to other 
area, the Neses or, you know, other, you know, tribal uh, languages and so on. And so that's just uh, what we, we did in terms of something that through an academic space with our privilege share ASU to be able to uh, keep that in mind with our communities, knowing that there was a need. And it wasn't mentioned earlier, but we did work with uh, the Benito Garcia Tribal Library out in our home community of Thonaut the Nation for multiple, a series of uh, or really a summer programming series of events. And this is where it all came. And they made this little cool flyer to think. Uh, both of them at the end, and uh, most recently working with uh, folks at the San Simone uh, School out in the the nation uh, remotely um, in light of what's still going on, even though we're kind of at the end of the, the pandemic, we'll say, you know, still need for that. And so I'm really proud of, of Lulu and, and Liz and the team. And so transitioning now into another area that we're able to engage um, or help, you know, provide a lifeline to our communities was through our community driven archives work. And as you probably aware with community driven archives in general, this is a whole presentation in itself. But with that in mind, you know, just to define what that means to us as indigenous people who have adopted this service here at ASU, it is a culturally appropriate approach to archiving in our community. It seeks to create intergenerational space to support cultural resiliency and archival sovereignty. And so I just wanted to establish these, our interpretation of what that means. And just an overview, and this is more or less kind of pre-COVID, right? Knowing that this was a service that we put forth back in two, uh, 2019. And so there's this uh, so overview of, you know, what it means to us and the work we've been able to do and why it's important. And yeah, just be able to really decolonize the archives for our community. And so in itself, this would be a program on the ground, right? As you can see with lovely, you know, native faces here, you know, out in Salt River Tribal Library on the bottom, or even at an Arizona gathering and tribal librarians meeting back back in 2019, yeah, so it's so long ago, but knowing that this was a service that our, our community members are looking towards, you know, and, and really building off the work of um, a colleague of mine here at ASU, Nancy Godoy's project around community-driven archives, initially focusing more on a more BIPOC, more overarching, you know, approach, but uh, with my uh, time here at ASU and working with her and her team and be able to, you know, uh, have those conversations and work in tandem with them and knowing that there is a need to have an indigenous um, focused approach to it because all our communities are different, whether you're African American, indigenous, uh, Latinx, queer, and so on, like there's all, CDA means different things for different communities. And so at, at Labriola, we did adopt that within our service model here for the reasons listed on the slide, mainly because of how we've been pushed out of the narrative historically. And a lot of this is kind of 101 when we get into archives and the need to diversify archives. So bear with me, but just to note that, you know, this is a need because we're, we're pushed out of the record, we're pushed out of the story. And if we are included, we're put in derogatory ways that don't align with who we are as indigenous people, um, mainly due to settler colonialism and just overall, you know, white supremacies, you know, and um, way of, you know, tailoring the record. And so, yeah, this is just, I mean, I don't have to read all this necessarily, but you get the picture that there is a need to break these narratives of extinction and how we need uh, different media, we need mediums like community driven archives to really help us support indigenous community memory. And of course, as we all know on this call that beyond or before colonization, you know, or even after, you know, we have oral traditions, right? And, you know, this is all established within our life ways who we are as native people, but we are still living in a contemporary setting now and we all have a paper trail, you know, we all have a digital paper trail. And so then how do we then begin to, you know, instill that archival literacy to know that there's a need to uh, provide that skill set to our, our community at a, at a place where they understand it and we can meet them where they're at. And so this is just, you know, kind of the context of this program because before COVID, we were doing a lot of work at uh, tribal communities uh, throughout Arizona, Southern Arizona. And then when everything happened with COVID, knowing that how do we take this very, you know, in-person, very, you know, intimate, very one-on-one -on -one type of program and put it, you know, or keep the conversation going in light of what was happening. And so with that, um, of course, as I mentioned with our partnerships and so on, but knowing that, you know, there's a, a need from folks, partners to have the service. And so that's when uh, with myself and, you know, our community driven archives uh, colleagues here at ASU, we began to uh, devise and one uh, intervention for that was uh, show and shares and show and shares are more or less virtual conversations, you know, about 
um, community memory and based on certain themes and based on certain um, topics. And so I guess for a better definition here, you know, it's a platform, a space online, you know, for whatever medium, whether that's Zoom or Google Meets, because there were some partners who use Google Meets and making that virtual space where we can just share stories and family memory. And so within the context of the pandemic, knowing that we were all isolated, you know, for health reasons, but also knowing that isolation led to, you know, us not being connected anymore, you know, or, you know, or in person and us as native people, you know, yearning for that, you know, sense of community. And so with show and shares to go back to the last slide, you know, we was an intervention uh, in collaboration with partners in particular, starting here at ASU in this case, uh, with other native departments that were looking towards us as, you know, for some space, right, or some virtual space to engage a community. And so we brought forth this idea uh, with uh, in particular here at ASU, the American Indian Student Support Service uh, Department, which is more or less the kind of baseline group for all native students incoming transfers and so on to have you know a support service department which covers you know whether that's academic success or just their well-being and so when they heard about or we are, they were already aware of what we we're doing with cda but just knowing that you could have a virtual space we partnered with them for a series of events throughout really 2020 and early 2021 just to have a virtual space based on themes that students wanted to talk about. And so as you can see on the screen, there's some examples around, we had around music, around traditional living in a contemporary setting, um, affirming indigenous knowledge, and just kind of even reflections on the past year, knowing that, you know, what happened with COVID. And so um, with that, you know, these all kind of amounted to very uh, focused themes and recognizing within that virtual space that just saying, hey, we want to share photos and talk you know, it led to a, a, a healing space because a lot of our community members, you know, it's just, they didn't have a sense of any, you know, connection, you know, because of COVID just trying to make do with their studies and also just, you know, some of the unfortunate, you know, realities happening in our communities with this, the impacts of COVID, you know, health wise. And so we led to this very first event, which I wanted to start with the show, you know, around wellness. And in the case of this, you know, we really focus wellness around conversations of, of uh, traditional kind of, I guess, or uh, memories around traditional uh, senses of well-being. And so some of the photos here, I and mean, when we crafted these events, you know, we worked with partners to say, well, what can we share, of course, on a flyer level to say, this is what indigenous wellness looks like. And within that, knowing that we can have these conversations based on what they would like to share. And so, for example, I'll just kind of leave this as a backdrop. Uh, one, of, one of our student partners, because she shared this for our Instagram platform, just to know that like creating a virtual space is, not, is more than just say like an activity or more than just, you know, uh, event that we should do. It also can be a healing space. And so within that healing space, you know, hearing these stories, right? And so in many ways, it became like a talking circle um, where we can, um, you know, heal with one another and knowing that for photos in this case, you know, it was kind of the initial starting point, knowing that these photos have power behind it, have, you know, medicine behind it, but also knowing that um, in the long run, they should be preserved, right? And so we get into that kind of conversation in time to know like, okay, we have this program, it's meant to really have a dialogue, it's meant to uh, sense, create that sense of community, but within that community, you know, it's based around photos and, you know, Western information objects, as they say, and so knowing that they need to be preserved. And so that was our intervention to say, well, this is what you should do to preserve. And so within that, we're able to um, really start to have a conversation around archiving, because uh, I think a lot of folks, in many ways, they, they talk about the me their memories in the past, but then they don't realize there's a, I guess, a responsibility to preserve that. And so it was a good intervention with the student body to really share whether it's the old photos, which I'll get into like what we went into with the archival one-on-one -on -one, and also the digitally born objects that they're unaware, you know, that they do degrade if they're not, their um, JPEGs, not TIFFs and so on, you know? And so just having kind of that moment to share like, hey, that's an awesome photo, but also we need to preserve that. And so with that, you know, there was other themes moving beyond the first one, a series of workshops or a series of events, and one was around affirming indigenous knowledge. And so just to give an example, um, go to the next photo, because um, this photo here was actually uh, uh, upon permission from Lourdes's family, a picture of her uh, great grandparents and, you know, her, her elders in that sense. And just to like say, hey, like, here's this image and it's affirming knowledge. And here's the story about my relative who was, uh, uh, you know, worked in the medical field and so on. And so not many folks know that, you know, that history of Otham, you know, resiliency, whether that was now in COVID or back then going to school to be a nurse and so on. 
And so that was just part of it was to kind of spark the conversation. But for one example, I'll just go to the next photo. And I believe Liz would like to share some words. Yeah, so just as an example of kind of how um, we would share and how other people who joined our sessions would share um, photos um, and how important archiving is, is by doing this. So say like um, we were doing this presentation and I did share this photo actually, and this is a picture of me and my little sister who's looking at me at my um, kindergarten graduation. And, you know, it just really represents to me kind of my personal resilience in education and my perseverance in it as a, an indigenous person and how I'm gonna continue on recreating this picture at every graduation. There's one of me at my high school and so on and so. Um, yeah, and it was really my working here at Labriola that led me to see how important it was to preserve these types of memories and really um, the importance of archiving and that it's not something that is far in the future that we do at the end of our lives, but we're constantly doing it every day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so, you know, just sharing that to, you know, the undergraduates, to even just community members, because this was open to community as well, and this, you know, kind of, you know, having, or having that healing space, but knowing within that healing space, there's a, um, a need to bring up archival literacy to really say, you know, are you ready to be a community archivist, right? You're all documenting your history in your own way. And it needs to be shared, but on your terms. And so that really kind of then led to back to full circle, the beginning pre-COVID work that we were doing. And without getting into kind of the uh, gritty details of, of, you know, the virtual side, and we did do some um, virtual um, uh, talks of what we did before. And a lot of it, a lot of it was already like in presentation format, right? When you're in a large hall with community and you're going through your slides and just going through the motions. But one thing that was missing. Uh, or one key thing that was hard to duplicate, you know, was kind of our in-person activities. Like I'm sure we've all like had struggles here, you know, trying to do virtual engagement where there's just that need to have hands-on, you know, interaction, whether that's with uh, actual material, you know, because in our workshops, we would pass around older photos and, you know, have them look, go through like a photo analysis session and, you know, really kind of put on their archivist hat to then begin to see, you know, like the inscriptions and everything on it and just the, you know, the type of photo and so on. And so that was one of the areas that we couldn't fully or initially uh, had issues with, you know, about duplicating or, uh, you know, trans uh, or doing online. Um, but so with that said, we did in true time begin to develop ways to do that. And so without, you know, kind of just thinking that we have like a general presentation and then we get into an activity. One way we got into the activity was using a platform card called Padlet. And Padlet's an interactive medium where folks in real time can comment on you know what they're seeing and so in the case of here i'll just uh click on the link to show uh what i'm referring to was that we began to you know convert our programming online and using mediums like padlet to do photo analysis workshops where you know just imagine we're in a space now talking about photos and then you know we would kind of build off you know what you're seeing here and granted we're limited from a digital perspective right we can't see on the back of the photo unless it was scanned and so on but what's there but this to go for the motions right of like what does that photo analysis look like and so this was this uh, being that it's anonymous on here I was open to share kind of feedback from a past workshop we did on phone on the nation and so within that you can see um, you know, the questions that we would ask, and these were questions that we would ask in person anyways, more on a, a form that we would give out. And this is to really kind of start to instill like that, not just archival literacy, but a firm community knowledge, because within it, you get to see how this landscape, you know, uh, people's view of it, and you can see the, some of the comments here, and, you know, also knowing that within our own language, because uh, Baba means like grandpa and Otham, depending on um, what side of your family, and just seeing that, you know, this has, uh, you know, you can kind of start having a community conversation around these photos. And so um, I'm not sure if Liz, you can plug in the Padlet link in the chat for me since I'm talking, but um, if you can uh, drop it in there. But again, just using like mediums like this to be interactive and make this a 10, 15 minute session, uh, better than just us talking about photo analysis, kind of like what I'm doing now, but giving the, 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 the community the opportunity to engage in it. And so, yeah, we would use this uh, in those workshops just to engage the conversation and really start talking, kind of breaks the ice in many ways. And just a kind of shameless plug, this is actually a photo of myself and my grandpa 
And it was cool because when community was talking about it, they're like, oh yeah, that looks like that trail going up to so-and-so, Ethos Key, which is a sacred place for us. And it's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, So it was kind of cool to know that our community memory was affirmed, like just doing this type of interaction. And granted, it is in person or online, um, but a way to keep the conversation going. And so I'll go back to the slides here. Um, but really, you know, this, I just, the main takeaway I wanted to share with what I'm sharing is that, you know, we had to get creative about keeping the conversation going around community driven archives. And ideally, of course, it, we need to be in a community space, right? But we can make those virtual spaces online. It just takes a lot of work and also knowing to get creative with different platforms. Like it made sense for us to use Padlet. Uh, it might be you know more sense to use other platforms, but that was just one part of it. So I'll end there and pass it to Liz. Yes, and so part of um, doing all this and uh, with the impacts of COVID, how do we really engage and communicate with community? You can go to the next slide. Um, this is how we used um, social media. And so for us, what social media is, is uh, Labriola social media pages are used as an interactive content sharing tool and notice board for events. All platforms keep patrons up to date on the library material services resources available. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so these are our main platforms. We of course also have our library website, but I'm assuming a lot of you have already, you know, really gotten to know your library websites. Um, and so we primarily use Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, and I'm going to break down each one and how we utilize them. So in Facebook, we try to use all of the kind of um, tools that are available. So for instance, you can create calendar events that people can um, say that they will be attending and have all the information available for that event. And during COVID, obviously, a lot of them were virtual. And so we could provide Zoom links, a time and a notification. And that first image right there is a, an event flyer from um, just this last month um, about the Apache Leap and Community Production Model um, uh, talk. And so there's also options to um, share events live on the platform, which is the second photo where we had one of our open mic um, poetry sessions uh, go on Facebook Live. And then there's the stories as well, where people you know, are spending their time and scrolling, and those are connected to our Instagram stories. And so in our Instagram, this is primarily where we uh, use a lot of our content and engage with a lot of our patrons. So um, obviously there's events and in the same kind of way as Facebook, you can use um, kind of a widget in the story section to create um, a notification for your patrons, which is that first photo. And there's also the option to share live events on the platform, which we have done before with our lo-fi sessions um, with indigenous artists. Um, and we've streamed them live on IG, uh, on Instagram, for students to engage with. There's also our stories, which we share our services and updates about the um, library. So for instance, that Labriola is open, we have snacks, you know, just sharing what's available and that we're here. Um, it's also a way to share content. So in the second photo on the top right, you have a reading list where we've actually been able to um, collaborate with the American Indian um, Policy Institute here at ASU and create reading lists for for our students. And there's also a way to communicate with our community. For instance, the last photo is a pop-up um, where we played cards for decolonization with students. And even with the best um, winning jokes, we ended up putting them on Instagram and using interactive tools on the stories so that people could engage with that online. And finally, that is a way to network through um, messaging with other orgs and collaboratives and institutes and clubs on campus and outside of campus um, to share our content. And so that's when we kind of get into more of the fun aspect of, of our social media platform. Uh, we really wanna create a personality and show um, kind of our decolonial edge as Labriola is in, in this um, AC institution. And so we um, use TikTok to share book recommendations and newest arrivals from our OpenStax. Um, and you can go ahead and click on that first TikTok if you would like. Just a creative way to engage with students. <laughs> Thank you. 
And so as you see, those were a bunch of new arrivals and it's just a way to, you know, in an entertaining way to engage with students online. Um, there's also um, our miscellaneous kind of, it's a newer kind of platform. And so we just kind of figure out ways to create creative ways of interacting with students online. So the next TikTok we have is actually kind of um, just a promotion for one of our events that we did. Yo, y'all ready? Let's go down. <laughs> And so um, with this, we're able to, you know, just share a bunch of different content. And also all of this content is shared onto Instagram where I feel like most of the interaction happens. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So why all this is so important, um, social media platforms can assist indigenous libraries and, and reach communicate uh, to a wider audience, specifically native youth. Um, where social media has kind of the idea that it can either displace or complement libraries and our resources. Um, and as our world transfers more into a digital realm, I think it's important for tribal libraries to work with the times and find ways for the social media to complement our library services. And that is by engaging with social media. Um, we don't wanna be regressive to our goals of sovereignty um, in educating, indigenizing and decolonizing all of our spaces including the digital realm. And so um, social media can also promote indigenous librarianship and community archives and develop networks and share resources with community. And so this is all more than engagement. All of these things have been shared on social media in one way or another, where there was a post created, where we um, added more commentary about its significance and importance, or whether they were just shared online through um, Zoom or through live events. Um, this is just what, uh, to me, libraries are community spaces, and we're able to create that both in person and in the digital realm. And so when we started to develop this, okay, so how do we really engage with people on social media? You have to be consistent. And so we had to ask ourselves a couple of questions, you know, what is essential one for our patrons to know about the library? And so we kind of narrowed that down to events, whether they were virtual in person or hybrid and how to notify people about that. We have our resources sharing about our new arrivals, book recommendations and lib guides. Um, of course, our services, our location hours, library and archival services and workshops that we do. And uh, then our content sharing, our personality and the community of the library. And again, we had to go next slide, please, um, and ask ourselves what kind of content was Labriola going to share? Um, and so, previous to my hiring, I actually, you know, was tasked with um, social media when I got here, and I had a document that Alex, Lulu, and Shaylee, and some other people had worked on previously to talk about what is, you know, the pers what is the um, way we want to represent ourselves online. And so using that, we boiled it down to a few consistent posts that we could create that really reflect Labriola's vision with indigenous research, scholarship, cultural expression, memory keeping, and lifelong learning. And so um, the consistent posts that we are able to create um, are our monthly quotes, our book recommendations, and our indigenous badass, and our blog posts. And I will break down each of those for you as well. So for our monthly quotes, um, a student worker or staff member may choose a quote from a book and our open stacks are distinctive collections that they would like to highlight. And so for this post, this was actually during uh, Black History Month, uh, I had created this post where I give some insight into the content of the book. I've been here all along, all the while um, by Dr. Elena E. Roberts. And I share a bit about the author and as well as what I gained from reading this book, the knowledge I gained and why I feel it is uh, important for other people to engage with these books. And so this is a way to have the personality and really um, share and highlight um, our indigenous literature. And then we have our book recommendations, which you have already seen on TikTok. Um, and so we showcase our latest arrivals, like in that first one, um, or we have kind of a theme book recommendation. And if you would like to click on this TikTok. 
So this one is announcing the 14th annual Labriola book winners for the book awards. And that was posted just yesterday. Um, and so you can see we kind of have themes towards uh, these book recommendations as well. And previous we've had themes with Native leaders, Heritage Months like Hawaiian Heritage Month or Native American Heritage Month, um, and also themed with different genres like graphic novels. And then we have our Indigenous Badass, and this is a really fun one, I believe. Um, and so a student worker staff chooses an Indigenous leader or an ally in the Indigenous community that they would like to recognize for their work. And so these two posts, the first one is about Rashida Scott Blades, who um, is her last day is tomorrow um, and she has been such a great help and educator for me when it comes to libraries and um, so I kind of just highlight all the greatness um, that she has been to Labriola as an ally to um, our mission and vision. And then the second one is of uh, Amber McCrary and she is an amazing Dene, um, you know, uh, publisher. Uh, with her own publishing company and she creates zines and so we just like to highlight their work and what they do for the community um, you know really showing and sharing indigenous excellence um, and allies excellence um, in these spaces um, and then finally we have our blog posts which go along with our website uh, and we share these on social media as well, kind of summarize a little bit um, into um, the content post. Um, and social work, uh, student workers and staff um, have an opportunity to take a deeper dive into indigenous literature, librarianship and community driven archiving. And so, um, for instance, in that first picture, it's just a couple of examples you have um, a highlight of the beautiful um, autumn design table that we have on the second floor of the Hayden Library. Um, and of course, there's other uh, book recommendations and stuff like that, reviews, and reclaiming Indigenous memory scapes, the role of Indigenous-led archival initiatives. That's something that Alex Soto, myself, Lourdes, and a previous coworker, Mia Johnson, had written, um, really sharing what we've gained from um, Indigenous-led archiving. And so with all of this, it seems like a lot, but you know, with a good team that is passionate and consistent and on top of their stuff, um, you can really implement this process and everybody can do this now. Everyone has a phone um, to operate with their, um, with their libraries and to be compatible with the resources and literature and exposing that online where people are already um, investing their time. And so we basically come up with a monthly um, strategy where we come up with a theme or focus of the month that is aligned with events. So for instance, this March, it was a focus on the relationship with the land since we had a hike um, out in the land and the um, movies that we were showing were based around land as well. Um, and so we would align the indigenous badass with somebody who is working with land stuff, um, our book recommendations, having it all be themed with that as well. And we would assign this to people um, to create the content that align with the monthly quotes, indigenous badass, book recommendations or blog, and uh, create an online calendar for social media curators. And we used Outlook Calendar. Um, of course, everybody can use what is fit, fitting to them, um, but this is something that we can all do. And so my takeaways, um, are that social media platforms are compatible with indigenous libraries, librarianship and archives. It gives us an opportunity to share the indigenous like content resources and services provided by indigenous libraries. It creates an outlet to share with and create um, community um, with your library. Um, social media platforms also create accessibility to a wider audience as going virtual um, and engaging online can engage further. Um, and social media is fun. It takes time to build. Um, and it is something that your libraries can engage with your patrons today. Um, and the pictures that I have here are, you know, the first one is from August and the second one is from May. So that's 10 months. Um, and you can see just a little bit of the progression that we've made in our followers. So on TikTok, initially we had 318 and now we are up to 1,500 
Um, and then with Instagram, we're also uh, previous in August uh, by uh, 479, and we've practically doubled that by uh, May to 864. So um, yeah, this is just showing how awesome our growth is and what indigenous led um, social media and libraries and what their compatibility and their powers together can bring to um, our communities. Well, thank you both for, for sharing. Uh, you know, of course it's always interesting online to talk about things online, <laughs> what we're doing, but um, I think, on, I guess to kind of bring it full circle, you know, knowing our, our mission and vision here at Labriola and, you know, knowing that um, we are privileged in that sense, working at an academic institution like ASU um, to, you know, embark on, on some of the work we're doing here, but knowing that it doesn't stop at ASU. And that's something, you know, myself as a director, as an Autumn, Thon Autumn community member, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're all community members in our respective areas and knowing that, you know, we want to make a sense of community here in person, obviously, with our in person spaces and events, but online, you know, and finding those ways to connect, uh, you know, the, you know, what we're fostering here, you know, for cultural resiliency, and which at times or at many times, you know, intersects with decolonization and how can we use, you know, our, our resources in this case of books and archives to really uh, have that conversation in a way that can uh, empower folks, you know, to be able to stay, you know, and finish their studies at ASU, but also knowing when they get back home or wherever they're going to, you know, embark in their journey to know that you, it's, so it's, it's uh, not just okay to be indigenous, you know, it's, you should be proud to be indigenous in those spaces. And I think, through indigenous uh, libraries like the Labriola and obviously our tribal libraries throughout the so-called US and Canada, that it's important that they are a third space to really build that resiliency and foster that. And so I'm just proud of, you know, every, all the words shared by my awesome student team. They have all the, the, the dopest ideas we'll say in terms of doing this type of work. And I'm really happy that they are able to find and channel their passion here. And so I think overall, um, you know, that's it for now. Um, we are, at least me and Lourdes are presenting at this year's ATOM too, if you have questions around community-driven archives, that's a different component. But yeah, we're open for any questions, q and I know, um, I think we're a little early with our time, but just wanted to stop here. Awesome, thank you so much, Liz and Lourdes and Alex for, for sharing all of that. Um, all right, let's get some questions ready. Um, I wanna take one, um, one question that came up in the chat during the presentation first, and the rest of y'all can, uh, can um, add some questions to the chat or um, we'll have some time to unmute and um, hear from you directly. But um, Tiffany Chavis um, asked, um, do you find it has been difficult to uh, engage elders virtually? I, I think I can speak to this a little bit um, just because I do a lot of community driven archives with my own uh, tribal community with the Hitchitotham or the only non federally recognized um, tribal community out of the bands of the Autumn community so this technically 23 federal, or 23 tribal nations within Arizona, um, but 22 federally recognized but besides that we do a lot of, um, I meet with my tribal community about the archives and um, Alex is there as well for, because uh, he also helps my community in that way. And I think for the most part, it isn't too difficult, but I would say for our elders who don't know how to access Zoom, um, it is it is difficult learning that. It's a little beneficial when they have someone there that can help them or we can do what we can on the Labriola side to provide those resources to help our elders get on to Zoom, but they do wanna engage and they do wanna be in this space with us. They've made that clear. It's just how we can help them get, get on this platform basically. Um, but I'll hand it over to Alex too. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just thinking of the social media side. I'm sure we have some uh, tech savvy elders in our community and uh, I definitely have seen folks uh, various ages, you know, just kind of what we are followers and all the stuff that Liz mentioned earlier that um, it's pretty, you know, that part's straightforward as far as the, I'll get to the Padlet side. There was, uh, when we did those workshops, which I didn't share earlier in, in greater detail, was that we had to like show them how to use Padlet. So there was like, um, you know, within the talk, hey, we're gonna go to photo description. And within that, 
here is Padlet. And of course, many, most of our elders, like, what's that, you know? And so then like explaining, like really showing them, giving an example, two or three examples, um, just to really walk through the process. Um, Cause as we know, you know, our elders are kind of at different, um, you know, rates or understandings of how to use the computer and to know like, wow, I can type something here in real time, it's gonna pop up on the screen. And so this is like explaining kind of what to expect and like allocating that time within the workshops um, to do that. Cause I know I've seen, you know, I've, I guess some folks will, you know, sometimes assume folks know, but often they don't because they've never used it. You know, even to not make it a, a age thing either, even our young people at times have to know how to use Padlet. So even in our most recent community memory uh, shown shares uh, that's more embedded because, you know, we assumed, hey, you're younger, right? You're undergrad, you, you know how to use it. And they didn't know. And so I know there's a part in the workshop too that we give examples how to use it and explain what it is. And so, yeah, this is really kind of allocating time and just meeting where they're at because I've been in talks where folks totally know and other folks have no idea. <laughs> so just kind of working with the community on that. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um... It really is just kind of training, I believe, on the side of um, libraries and archivists um, and how do we really engage with elders um, and even kids. I think an important aspect of all the work that we've done virtually is really teaching how to use media or teaching how to use technology, whether that be the Zoom, whether that be the Padlet or um, even having them kind of discover it themselves by engaging with our social media and seeing, oh, what does this alarm do? or um, you know, how, how can I engage with this card game online? Um, so it's all something that we can, um, I think have trained and, and kind of uh, use it as a teaching opportunity as indigenous people. Excellent. Um, well, I'd like to invite those of us in the Zoom room to, um, to unmute and, and ask your question if you've if you got any. I'm not seeing others in the chat right now. A lot of accolades coming in, expressions of gratitude. Um, one question it looks like in here um, with COVID. Oh, never mind. It's not a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm wondering if we can just expand a little bit on that. Um, you know, the topic of of teaching digital skills like in the moment. You know, as you already have, like, all right, this is what we're trying to do. This is our this is our program, and just kind of pairing pairing that one on one training with um, with the, with the result and with the action. So can you speak a little bit about what that looks like with the um, archiving side of things? So when you're working with people to digitize their photos or their, their important documents, um, I, I see Lourdes smiling. I don't know if you got some stories for us. Well, I'm smiling because that was me. <laughs> I was literally that person. I remember like talking to Alex and I'm, I had no idea. I'm, I might be 21, but I'm not tech savvy. I don't even have a TikTok. I'm like, I think I still have like the old MacBook. I'm not even at the level people assume I'm at. And I remember just talking to Alex, like how do, when it, when it was about scanning or TIFFs and JPEGs, I had no idea how to work that out. And I think um, just going back to your question, I think Labriola does a great way of talking to community and breaking things down in a way where it's really easy to get going to the point where now, I mean, I have a whole, I, I, I tried to, um, I have, I do work for my own community. I'm the Hitchet Homechkam LLC's archivist now and, and see, it didn't start easily, but I think Alex did a great job of breaking that down to the point where um, now we go to Salt River or we engage with other communities and we're able, I'm able now to, um, to explain that process of scanning or that digital side a little better. Um, and then that, that's thanks to Alex for sure. It was one workshop we did. It was um, again, kind of tailoring it per community. Um, it was out in Pascuayaki in Guadalupe and they, it was during kind of the heart of COVID and folks out there wanted us to do an overview on scanning. And we're like, that's, how do we do that? You know, like we have to be on site. And even if we wanted to, there was regulations. And so 
what we did in that case with our tech savvy uh, student archivist here, <laughs> as mentioned before, uh, she just kind of went through the motions and just like did screenshots and just going through like what that would look like if we were in person with the scanner on the back end based on the scanner that we, we work with because every scanner has a different program interface. And to know like these are things to keep in mind around resolution, around, you know, format, you know, all kind of like those basic or, you know, 101s on like um, DPI and just like kind of saying it in a non nerdy way. And then the showing like, this is why we need to do this because of preservation standards and, you know, having that kind of conversation around how material can, um, you know, rot, digi you know, digitally rot and saying and talking to elders about it. Cause I remember for that workshop, it was like all elders, like they're all, I mean, I think it was maybe possibly like their, their elder center or I forgot the group. But this kind of breaking down that language, you know, and just saying, you know, this is what it looks like. And obviously in person, we would love to be sitting down with you and having a conversation. But for right now, just to kind of plant that seed and kind of knowing that COVID would eventually go away in time where we can. So this to show like kind of like we're saying with show and share is like, it's just have the conversation, put it in the plant that seed. And then in person, we can really show you what that looks like. So you can, you know, your grandkids can do it right and go from there. So that was our kind of loose experience with that. I think what Alex too, what he really touched on is that we, we already know as indigenous people, we code switch, but I remember having that conversation with Alex when we were meeting with my entire community. And I, I heard him code switch too, which he does when we're explaining to community, because if we're talking about these tips and these isms and schisms to our, our auntie or grandma, they're not gonna understand what the hell we're talking about. So but to, to tailor that, like what Alex is saying to our community, kind of code switching going back because we know how our communities are, we can break it down better. So when you have indigenous peoples leading this work, it's, it goes, it, it's a great way to reach out to our communities better and they understand this information better. Just to note in the chat, one of my colleagues here at ASU, Nancy Godoy, who I mentioned earlier with our overlap with the work we do, she plugged in some resources um, here to check out uh, the presentation, the, the, the toolkits and so on. And so those are resources we're working with here on to indigenize. Uh, you might see some familiar faces in the, the handbooks that we've created and you know all that, but yeah, definitely check out that link. Thank you. Um, you know, we've got just a couple minutes before we transition to the break. And I guess aside from the great resources that have been shared about, um, you know, getting started, I'm wondering if you could share just any words of advice for um, any, you know, any community organization, library, museum, um, who's trying to get started in um, encouraging community archives in their communities. I'll ask our community archivist here for the hatchet off them. What I always tell even my peers um, or the youth, I would say, is that you're already an archivist. And I know I kind of speak on that too with the Turning Points magazine um, on indigenizing the archives. We've already done this. This is something we've done. It's not completely, completely in the settler colonial way that we think of as, as just these documents, because a lot of indigenous peoples, we didn't have that, but it was orally. That's how we know our stories and our community memory. You are already an archivist in that way. Even to try engaging the youth, I always say, you know, do you archive your photos on Instagram? Like even clicking that, like you're doing the, that work already. And um, I think, and because we are, it's, it's a push. Um, I, I would just encourage everyone that you're already an archivist and it might not be in that, that settler colonial way, but if you're telling stories, if you're listening to your grandma, auntie or community um, and with your community memory or about your community memory, you're already doing the work. Um, but there's, there's obviously places like Labriola or um, other libraries who are doing this work and it's a great way to just get involved if you're really interested or you, you know, you want to bring that back to your community, but I would just empower them that they're already doing that work, even if they don't realize it now. And to add on that, in addition to just knowing that general baseline of we are already archivists, as Native people, we've always found a way to find a way, you know, with our resources. And so even if you have like a busted, you know, scanner or, you know, an outdated computer, I mean, it is still a tool. Obviously, we want to get more capacity and, you know, get some of these grants that were discussed earlier to really flesh it out. But like coming from a DIY kind of hip hop musician mentality, like, you know, for myself, it's like we, we can make do with things. 
and just knowing that we can maximize it to the best that we can. And also with our community members, like she's saying, like there's so much knowledge there. We just have to have that conversation and hopefully get some grants, right? Hopefully get some resources and or work with folks like Labriola in your community to build the framework and kind of help you get you started and knowing in time that that's the end game is to have that self-determination within your tribal library or your cultural space where you're doing that work. And it's not like us as ASU coming in because that's something I'm very clear on with our work is like, we are a resource, but you know, we want to be in conjunction with you know, community initiatives when, when appropriate, so. I'd also like to add, you know, a really important aspect of getting community started in archiving and interested in it is meeting them where they're at. Um, and for younger people, that's a lot of social media, you know, it takes up a lot of our time and our energy. And so meeting people where they're at, integrating um, these show and shares into their timelines that they can attend or um, these community driven or scanning um, days that they can um, attend as well, or just share with community. Um, we show again to add on to Lulu's point of like you're already archiving social media in itself is already archiving your life in the way that you are doing it so. Um, yeah it's really just meeting uh, the community where they're at. Um, uh, like Lulu was also saying with like the code switching and everything, you know, we know how to speak to our communities um, and we know how to listen to know that they know what's best for themselves. So. Thank you so much. You know, I just I get chills listening to some awesome students out here. I know that the, the future is really in good hands when we've got the youth involved. We know that, you know, if the kids if the kids want to do it, we know that this this good stuff is, is here to stay. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, take a brief break. Um, we are going to open up the breakout rooms for our next sessions already. But if we can go ahead and um, just take five, uh, five minutes or so, um, and you can join us in, um, you see these two breakout rooms that are being featured here um, for the rest of our program. We're gonna go ahead and try to begin um, right at, let's see, 3, 3.07 if, if we're able to. Um, thanks everybody. Okay, for any of the presenters, I have gone ahead and opened the breakout room, so you're welcome to join them. Um, it should pop up on your screen, or maybe you need to click more um, and then choose the breakout room you need to go into. Um, if you're having problems getting into a room, just let me know, and I am happy to put you in. You're welcome to type it in the chat if you need help getting into a room or um, talk aloud. Hi, Melissa. This is Helen Clements. Hi, Helen. How are you doing? Great. Good. What, this what is, room this would you like to go into? Number one. Number one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. There are several of my colleagues at OSU that I think would like to watch this or parts of it. Will it be permissible to share? Yes. Um, share the, the current Zoom link or any recordings? Not recording. I think it'd yeah. probably be simple because I'd like to watch parts of it again too. Yeah, definitely. We will um, make all of the recordings available and you can share as you wish. Perfect. Yeah, I, I think what, a couple of my people who do selection is uh, um, going to. Hi, can I get into, this is Lisa. So I just realized that I made a comment that was. <laughs> no problem. I think I was typing on another uh, thing. I'm on to my, a big one and then my iPad so I can see better. But um, <laughs> I think I was typing in my bracelet, hit it. Um, but can I get into a. Sure, which room would you like? Um, Uh, maybe uh, room two. Okay, one second. And I'll go ahead and put um, both of yours in there. Oh, awesome. All right, thank you. All right. I'm Hello, gonna... this is Terry Bowers. Can I try and group breakout room one? Okay. 
We got room one. There you go, Terry. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. This is Myra. I'd like to be in room two, please. Okay. Dinah, I have you in room two. Alejandra. Room one. Two, we had some fantastic library presentations. Um, feel really, really grateful to have been able to listen in on those. I hope hope you all in breakout room one uh, also enjoyed the speakers and the presentation. I was just like, uh, yeah, well, I got someone, I did get someone of the digital. Um, Okay, we're going to go ahead and um, transition into the last part of our program for today, um, which is really a skill share. Um, we want to hear from you about um, some of the things you've heard today, some information you're still searching for, because we know we've got a lot of experts in this Zoom room, people who've tried out different things, um, and you've got a lot of experience and expertise. Um, for your libraries and beyond. So what we have in mind is actually- I just don't know how to, it won't uh, let me submit it. Feature, um, feature a couple of questions that came up um, in the registration as well as throughout the past two days. Um, and everyone will have an opportunity to share some, some resources and some questions that they have. Um, if, let's see, so we're gonna have the ATOM staff um, bring up a tool, um, a Google tool called Jamboard, which is sort of like a virtual uh, whiteboard where we can uh, type people's uh, questions. Um, I see the link is here in the chat, but we'll we'll also be uh, sharing sharing that screen here at the beginning. Um, so our first question that we've got um, queued up is really about um, the you know the, the way we're using technology as well as the the actual technology that we've got. So we're um, curious to hear from you about what types of technology programs, services, and equipment um, that you offer your patrons. Um, you know, we want to hear what's going really well, but also some of the things that maybe uh, you know maybe need a do-over, maybe uh, you wouldn't do that again. I think that's that's going to be pretty valuable information for people. Um, for instance, in in breakout room two, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Wi-Fi hotspot lending. And how um, you know checking out a device that can that can connect people to the internet is is really great and and in fact pretty pretty life saving. But there's a lot of little little things you might not really consider all the time, like when you're limited by data. Um, how do you make that equitable for um, you know across the month for different patrons? Or if the service isn't even there, um, you know what good is that hotspot? So feel free to. Um, type in the chat or in the Jamboard directly. Um, and we can cap, uh, copy that over to the Jamboard. Um, we're also able to just unmute because we'd love to, to hear from you. And, and one little thing, Nicole. So we did post a Jamboard link, but only 50 people can get into Jamboard at a time. So if you can't access it, just post um, your response in the chat and we'll make sure that it's recorded on the Jamboard. Excellent. Oh, wow. Um, I see a, a comment in the chat about YouTube language classes. That's pretty exciting. And, um, if you'd like to share a little bit more about how that works, because um, that sounds like it could be quite involved. So maybe if, if you'd like to to add in the in the chat, um, I'm curious about um, who's who's creating those classes and um, how are you um, if you're featuring speakers, um, you know how you're selecting those speakers as well. Oh, I see no mic. <laughs> No worries.
master speakers teach. Okay. Mm. I'm not sure whose comment this is, but that's a, a pretty strong one. Um, it does not work to create programming and um, without reaching out to the community first. Um, you know, it's not not quite a if you build it, they'll come. It's you know, how do we how do we build these things together to to meet people's needs and interests? Any libraries out there um, offering, uh, I guess, loaning of equipment that maybe is a little unusual? You know, sometimes I see uh, libraries loaning, uh, you know, cooking equipment or power tools, <laughs> you know, the, the type of like uh, tools that we actually need in, in our lives too. Nicole, I'm not sure if you said it, but um... We're going to spend what about five minutes on each question Does that works so maybe another minute or so on this one and we can go on to the next. Perfect. Yep, uh, Internet access is certainly critical for for all of these things. Thank you. So is anybody checking out devices specifically to help with some of these virtual language programs or, or pairing that together as a program, a device and, um, you know, and language? Lots of online, uh, online learning opportunities. Discovery bags for adults. Uh, I see. Oh, great. Fishing poles. <laughs> That's great. Alrighty. Well, um, you know, again, everyone, you're also welcome to um, to unmute if you'd like to share a little bit more about um, some of those things that you've learned or you want to um, kind of hi highlight uh, different programs that you've got going on. But we'll go ahead and um, if oh, I'll just mention that if you're in this, um, if you're in the Jamboard, you are able to move back and forth between the slides, even if we're not discussing it at the time. So feel free to keep keep adding to the different questions or uh, move ahead if you like. Um, our second question, um, you know, because yesterday we had a lot of questions about um, cybersecurity and online safety. So we're wondering, like, who um, who in the room has strategies um, or maybe some some specific programming for helping patrons to stay safe online? Um, if you've got resources that we should know about, feel free to drop those in as well. With um, with some libraries uh, here in Arizona, we you know we know how um, online safety also includes media literacy, so the the evaluation of um, of information online, um, making sure that it's reputable, um, you know it's not uh, not too sensational just to get to get clicks and things like that. So sometimes I see that incorporated in um, in online safety trainings.
Oh, I like this um, this one about actually mentioning the current scams on the Facebook page. You know, a lot of people are probably probably scrolling through Facebook, so it's a, a good place to highlight uh, you know the scam of the week or, or what what people can look out for. Yeah, our uh, state president in Oklahoma just mentioned one that someone had tried to pull on her or tried to use her name to pull today. And she sent out a, an email to the uh, basically the leadership within the Oklahoma uh, group because somebody was scamming, trying to get money. Hmm. That, that happened this morning. It's very, timely. very timely. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering, does anyone have um, have resources on um, how libraries can keep their networks safe as well? Um, you know, sometimes the those open networks can be victim of um, you know cyber crimes or, or hacking as well. One thing I might jump in and mention um, about Jamboard, because um, we didn't really explain it, but make sure that when you're in here that you don't click clear frame, because that will actually clear everything off the Jamboard and we'll lose all of your fabulous um, responses. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yep. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and move to the um, the third question that because we've got um, two more we'd like to to highlight. Okay, so this one um, I'm really excited to hear from you. So, what are some of your go to technology resources that you use for staff? So this is like train the trainer type of materials like um, Web Junction or Niche Academy. Um, but also some of those tools for when you're implementing programs like a digitization process, you know, the Sustainable Heritage Network is really great for that. Um, the Indigitization Toolkit also has some great guides. Uh, library Juice, I think maybe some of my state library comrades are, uh, are, in, are in here with some of these, these resources, but go to, go to resources for staff training. Connecting to collections, that's a, a new one for me. Perhaps we can also add uh, ATOM webinars and, and trainings and um, some of those hands-on workshops around their, their annual conference. Okay, well, as we continue, um, Feel free to keep adding to, um, to this slide and others, um, but we're really excited for our last uh, Jamboard question to, to hear a little bit more from you. Go ahead and get over there. Yep. So um, we'd like to hear what are some announcements or opportunities or anything you'd like to share about some of your programming or things that you think would be um, useful for this group to know. You know what, what didn't we get a chance to cover today? Uh, Joan, I see you. You have a raised hand. Go, uh, go ahead and unmute. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Joan Kerr, and I'm uh, I'm not a, a native person, but um, I am the vice president of the, uh, a group called the North American Working Group, which is which is a a, a, a program of the Institute for uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And we have formed this working group, and there are five of them worldwide. 
but the North American Working Group, NAWG, is focusing on um, Indigenous peoples uh, across North America, which is Canada and the US. And um, we uh, would like to work with, collaborate uh, with um, Native people across North America for some of our programming, um, economic development. We're just announcing it today so we can make an appointment with whomever. I don't want to take up the time by telling us all about our program, but we have a really exciting um, education kit that um, is focusing on STEM education and electronics. And we think that the um, this system, and we were invited by Susan. Thank you so, so much, Susan. And like I said, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I also have my colleague um, on the call who is um, Rajan, who is responsible for that education program. And uh, I just want you to, to know before he comes on that we are very much aware that we have to talk to you and uh, understand the groups. And we're that's why we came on to listen today. Um, so, um, uh, oh, Susan's asked me to share a link. Oh, I don't have a link on me right now, but um, it's the the whole organization which will not give you what we are doing. But um, these are education kits that would uh, service kids from eight to 108 years of age. Um, so um, we would like to, if we can't do anything today, we'd like to invite you to our meetings, if nothing else, and um, uh, have you, oh, yes, there's a smart village. Um, thank you, Rajan. Would you like to say something quickly, Rajan? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Joan, and thank you, Susan, Nicole, and all others who organized this. This was a wonderful experience, a very eye-opening experience as to how much work and how much passion goes around the tribal libraries here in the U.S., uh, I myself was born in the mountains of India. I live in Boulder at present, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, we have been working, the organization that the Smart Village organization works in four continents in underserved communities. And we have been introducing these kits uh, into these communities in India, in Africa. And now we are looking to see if we can also work with, with, with people within this community, within the tribal community in the US, uh, to see if uh, we can find a path forward where together we can bring these, uh, these kids which create vocational awareness in children as old as eight, uh, as young as eight years old. So again, I may very well be the last person standing between you and the end of this great session today. So just to wrap up, um, uh, I have put my email address in the chat and we just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to introduce ourselves and we are available for further uh, conversation, further consultation with whoever is interested, whichever library group, whichever other group is interested. We are open to discussing with you on how we could potentially move this forward. So thank you once again, and congratulations for the great work that you're doing. Um, thank you, uh, Joan and Rajan. Uh, who else, else has a, a resource or um, an upcoming event that you'd like to share out with us? I see from uh, Lorianne Rory about um, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Um, I'm not sure when the deadline is for those, but those are uh, coming up. Okay, the, um, you know, this Jamboard will, will still be up even after we close out for the day. So if you've got more things you'd like to add, please do. Um, Atom will be compiling this for us and, and sharing it back out um, along with all of the other um, resources and the presentation materials and the recordings from the past two days. 
Um, I think we have a link to our um, evaluation uh, questionnaire for you to fill out, but we'll also um, be able to send that to you by, uh, by email as well. Yes, Nicole, I just posted the link in the chat, but we will be following up with an email that has all the recordings and the link to the survey. Perfect. Um, well, I wanted to, to thank you again for, for sticking around for the end of our day, for um, you know, your participation and for, for showing up um, to this really important discussion. Um, a big thank you to all of the presenters who um, were so generous with their time and with their expertise to share with us all today. You know, when we were um, putting this together, we really wanted to have some, some uh, hands-on tools that people could use right away while trying to cover this really broad topic of uh, broadband and technology in the library, which we know um, really has an impact um, for our library users, but for the community and on and on to, to ways we, you know, we might not even be able to imagine. So thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. And I look forward to being in contact with you and um, hopefully you can, you've been able to connect with some people here and we can, we can bring some good things to come. So thanks very much.